I'm Becca and today we're going to make a posnicuing task in PsychoPie. So this might sound familiar to anyone that's watched previous PsychoPie tutorials. And that is because a previous version of this does exist. Um, but today we're going to be recreating this using PsychoPie 2020. So we're going to familiarise ourselves with some of the new uh, looks and features of PsychoPie 2020. So to start with, all of the materials that you will need in order to uh, make this task are available on the previous link. Uh, so if you search uh, PsychoPie Posna, that will bring up, in addition to the current video you're watching, um, the uh, initial version. And this zip file here is what you're going to want to download uh, in order to have the materials for this task. I'm going to open up uh, this folder, this Posna First uh, folder. So you should have uh, downloaded that from the previous YouTube tutorial we mentioned uh, and extracted the content. Now you can see that I have just saved a file here and called it Posna. Now that is a SciExp document, so indicating that it is a PsychoPy uh, experiment file. Um, but we also have this Excel file here that we've named conditions. Now if I open this up, this essentially corresponds to three parameters uh, named QFile, target X, and is valid that I'm going to reset uh, to be a new value on each trial. So each row here corresponds uh, to a trial. Now, anyone familiar with the Posner queuing task um, will know, and if you're not familiar, we'll cover it briefly now, that the Posner consists of a trial structure in which a queue, um, so in our case, an arrow pointing to the left or right is presented, followed by a target that will be presented either to the left or right. Now, if the arrow and the target location are congruent, then we uh, can call this a valid trial. But if they are incongruent, so uh, the we are queued in the opposite direction to where the target is presented, that is an invalid trial. Um, and we have those trials in our conditions file as well. So here, what we have is a path to an image. Now that's a bit clearer if we look in our images folder that contains two arrows and a target. Um, now what we're getting here is we have the left arrow uh, or the right arrow. Our target X corresponds to the X coordinate in which we are going to present our target image. Uh, so we can present it to the left of fixation. Uh, this is in height units. Um, or you could present it to the right of fixation. And this final column just tells us if that trial is valid or invalid. Now, notably, um, if you want a particular proportion of your trials to be of a particular trial type, this is where we control that. So you can see that of these 10 trials, we have two trials on which we have an invalid stimulus presentation. So we have 20% of our trials are invalid. So if you're wanting to control the proportion of trial types, you do that in your conditions file. Okay, so now we've familiarized ourselves with our files, um, we can get going starting making our task. So the first thing we want to do is we want to present that cue stimulus. So you select images because we know that we're going to present the image, the left or right arrow, and we're going to call this Q. Now for now we will just present this uh, image at the very start of our trial um, and we're going to present it for 700 milliseconds. Now this is where it gets interesting so we know we want that image to be different on every trial. Um, so what we do is we can tell PsychoPy we're going to take a variable um, that we are importing from our conditions file. And I'll show you how we import that in a moment. But essentially, if we start a field with this dollar sign, 
that means we're either um, referring to a variable or we're going to put Python code directly in this field. Um, at the moment, we're just going to call this Q file, and that is the name of our header column in our conditions file. Now, importantly, we can set this to uh, set every repeat or set every frame. Now, for the moment, we'll just set it every repeat. So what that means is uh, every time we repeat this routine, that is going to reset, um, which is important if you think that we're going through a new trial on every repeat. OK. So what do we want following our queue stimulus? We want a target. We want this target to appear on the offset of our queue. So we can just say 700 milliseconds for now. But this time, we want this stimulus to be presented um, indefinitely. So for that reason, we leave this field empty here. Now, this image is going to be the same every time. It's not changing on every repeat like our queue stimulus. So because of this, we can just give a path directly. And notably, our images are all actually uh, PNG images. So that's useful if you want an image that retains information on transparency. Um, so for example, when we present an arrow, we don't want to see that arrow on top of a white square. We want to just see the arrow. Um, so PNG images are useful for that kind of thing. Now this time, the thing we want to change on every repeat is actually the position of the target. Now here, we have our X and our Y coordinate. Now remember last time we uh, added a dollar sign to the start of our field. Now we don't need to do that this time because we can see that that is actually already inbuilt into this parameter. So for that reason, we can just say target X. And you can see that we've got a nice little alert for us saying that we should be setting this to uh, update. So we will do that and set it to change every repeat. Okay, so what's the final thing we need in our trials? We need a response. Now, for this response, we're going to use a mouse component. And the reason for that um, is because we're going to push this online in a later tutorial. And a mouse component rather conveniently translates to touches on touchscreen devices. So we could use a keyboard component, but obviously if a participant tries running it on a tablet or a phone, then this isn't going to work because that device doesn't have a keyboard. So we're just going to use mouse response and we're going to call it RESP. Now we want participants to be able to respond from the onset of the target. So we set the start time to be the same as what we used for our target. And what's really important is we set the duration of this to also be infinite. So if we'd set a limited time frame on this component, the problem there would be that we have a we have a stimulus that's been set to present indefinitely. So if this stimulus continues to be presented, but a participant can no longer make a response, that's going to cause a problem because your routine doesn't know when to end. It's just going to carry on, um, which is not what we want. So we leave this uh, empty. OK, so end routine. So this tells us that this particular response is going to end our routine. Uh, so we'll move on to the next trial once a response has been made. Um, now, it might be you don't want the trial to end based on a key press or a mouse press, I should say. Uh, in that case, you'd use never. It might be that you want the participant to be able to click anywhere. Now, for us, that's just not the case. We want them to click the target. So we want a valid click. And we're going to save the information from the mouse on the click. Now, in order to know what's a valid click, we need to tell our mouse component what is a clickable stimulus. And for us, it's the component named target. Now, this will also tell us what information is stored from our click. Now, at the moment, it's name. So that is just the name of the component. But we could um, save 
any of the information from the other fields in that component. So it could be, for example, that we save image and that will save the image path for the image that was presented in the, on that particular trial. For now, we, ju we just need name. We don't need anything else. OK, so I'll save. Now, the final thing that we have to do is at the moment, this is just a single trial. And also, of course, we know that we are setting our components using variables from our conditions file. So like that Q underscore file and that target underscore X. But we haven't fed that into PsychoPy yet. It doesn't know about those variables. So to do that, we add a loop. And we can click where we want that loop to be. And here, the important field is the conditions field. So we can click browse and we can select our conditions file. And we know that that is accurate because here it says we have 10 conditions with three parameters. Q file, target X and is valid. So that all looks, uh, that looks great. That looks like exactly what we wanted. We can set a number of other things about our trials here. So for us, we only want two repetitions. So this corresponds to how many times the trials in that conditions file are going to be repeated. If we wanted only a certain number of rows to be presented, we specify those here. And a random seed essentially tells us, OK, so if we're presenting our trials randomly, do we want them to be random for every single participant? Or do we want the same random order, in which case we can use a random seed? For us, we're going to use a different order on each for each participant. And also we could set the loop type. So we're just going to use random, but it might be that we want sequential. This is handy, for example, if, if you have a pseudo random order, then you preset your conditions file to be that pseudo randomized order, and then you click sequential in PsychoPy. You could also use full random, which means, so at the moment we have two repetitions of 10 trials, so 20 trials in total, and that would randomize all of those trials. But for us, we're just going to randomize within the repeat. So it'll be 10 randomized trials followed by 10 randomized trials um, and so on. OK, cool. Now, the very, very last thing, uh, just because I am showing you this on uh, my external monitor, is I want to look at experiment settings. Now, this is kind of handy if you want to gather other information from your participants. So it might be, for example, you want age. For us, we're just going to keep participant and session. But this is also useful for if you're wanting to counterbalance your participants. That's something that we will cover in another tutorial. For us at the moment, I just want to set this to be my second uh, monitor so that you can see what my task looks like. And I'm going to at the moment say I don't want a full screen window. That's because this is the first time I'm running this task. And if something goes wrong and it's in full screen, it's going to be awful difficult to get out of. Um, so I'll just click um, not full screen at the moment. Righty ho, let's see uh, how that goes. OK, so you can see we have an arrow and then we have a target that we can click on. So we've run a full trial. And then we go back to our file here and we can see that there is a new folder named data. So here we can see that we have an Excel file. This is a CSV file. We have a text uh, document, which is a log logging uh, chronological information in time. We won't go into that in too much information, but that's uh, useful for if you want, um, say, to look at where things are occurring in time and just kind of debug uh, and sanity check your task. And then we have a side app file. Now, this is really useful for if you're analyzing something uh, using Python. At the moment, we can just look at our CSV file. OK, so if we look here, our main uh, field of interest is this resp.time. So we can see a number of things have been saved. Remember, our mouse component is called resp. So here we can see there's resp.time, uh, resp.left, so that's if my left or right 
the mouse keys were pressed uh, middle and right. You can see I consistently pressed the left key. Also, we actually have the X and Y coordinates, so we could see the accuracy of where I clicked if we wanted to. Uh, am I always clicking in the middle of that target? Am I clicking around the edges? Um, it's another kind of level of accuracy, which is, is kind of cool. For a very quick analysis of our data, let's just hide everything between rest time and is valid. And I'll just insert a column here to look at or to insert my averages. So I'm going to sort these now just so I can sort out the is valid from the valid from the invalid trials. So I'm going to custom sort and I'm going to do that based on column C. OK, so then imagine I've just run my first participant. I don't want to do a full analysis script yet, but I just want to check, right, am I getting some kind of obvious Posner queuing effect? Um, so let's do this. And, okay, that's quite a large Posner queuing effect. Um, I'll just move my Excel sheet over so that you can actually see that. So my response time on valid trials was on average 461 milliseconds. But in our invalid trials, it was 792 milliseconds. So that is uh, our Posner queuing effect. So uh, that's the end of our first tutorial here on how to make a Posner queuing task using PsychoPy 2020. Uh, I hope that you found this informative and uh, we'll see you in our other tutorials.